Greetings, and thank you for joining us today for the National Conference of State Legislatures, Natural Resources, and Infrastructure Committee's Spring Webinar Series. My name is Ann Teagan, and I am a program principal in the Transportation Program at MCSL, and I will be your moderator today. This webinar is brought to you by a partnership project of MCSL's Transportation Program with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Our long-standing partnership with NHTSA is designed to provide legislators and legislative staff balanced, comprehensive, and in-depth information on traffic safety issues. The webinar we are bringing you today is Navigating the FAST Act, Exploring State Highway Safety Incentive Grants. Before we begin our webinar, I wanted to let you know about two other webinars in the NRI Committee's Spring Webinar Series. On June 9, 2016, we will be holding the webinar entitled GMOs, a Recipe for a New Label. And on June 23rd, we will be hosting a webinar on the future of distributed solar energy. To register for these webinars, please see the link below. As you know, the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, or the FAST Act, is the latest tra transportation reauthorization bill, and it was signed into law in December of 2015. Today, our webinar will focus on the highway safety incentive grants available through the FAST Act and how states are able to qualify for these grants. Our program will include, first, a very short overview by me of the web resources available to you on NCSL's website related to traffic safety. Next, I will introduce Eric Strickland from the Governor's Highway Safety Association to discuss the incentive grants available to the states through the FAST Act. And finally, we are pleased to have with us Barbara Sowers, the Director of the Office of Grants Management and Operations at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. She will discuss the informal rulemaking related to the FAST Act that was released last week by NHTSA. So today's webinar will include presentations by these panelists, followed by a question and answer period. To submit a question, which you can do at any time, please use the chat feature on the left-hand corner of your screen. In addition, this webinar in its entirety will be archived and posted on our traffic safety page. So again, thank you so much for joining us. NCSL's transportation program has worked tirelessly to provide up-to-date information on a variety of traffic safety topics. As you can see, we have a resource page for 15 different traffic safety topics. On NCSL's homepage, you can go to the Research tab at the top of the page and hit Transportation. The Navigate bar on the right side of the screen has a, a number of different transportation-related topics. As you can see, we have web pages on bicycles and pedestrians, impaired driving, federal transportation issues, and traffic safety. If you click on the Drunken and Impaired Driving option, information about drunk driving and drugged driving will pop up. If you click on the Traffic Safety option, a number of different resources will come up, including our latest report. But if you scroll down, you will find we have web pages for all of the traffic safety topics listed on this slide. So for example, if you clicked on Team Drivers, the informational page will come up. I wanted to show you how to access this information because after a transportation reauthorization bill passes, NCSL receives many questions um, about various state laws. For example, our teen drivers page has a map that depicts nighttime driving restrictions for teen drivers, which is an element of the GDL requirement in the FAST Act. I also wanted to let you know about two other resources NCSL has related to traffic safety on our website. First, we have a traffic safety legislation database that provides real-time information about traffic safety bills that have been introduced in the 50 states and the District of Columbia. You can search bills all the way back to 2007 by state, topic, keyword, year, status, or primary sponsor. Another resource we have is the Traffic Safety Trends Report. 
Each year, NCSL Transportation Program staff produce this in-depth document that includes information from all the topics that we cover, and the report includes 10 state law charts that give information from each state on how primary seatbelt laws, red light cameras, and others. I'd now like to introduce our first presenter, Eric Strickland. Eric is responsible for congressional relations, policy analysis, and is he, he is the federal agency liaison for the Governor's Highway Safety Administration. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Let me just get up to my webinar here. One second. Uh, I want to thank you again for uh, inviting the Governor's Highway Safety Association to uh, present to you and to share uh, our kind of view of Title IV, which is the Highway Traffic Safety section of the FAST Act. Um, the FAST Act is a very large bill, and um, I want to say that Title IV is one of the more important pieces of it because it impacts uh, safety on our roadways and as, um, is often cited by uh, and its administrator and others uh, due to some great research from them. 94% of, of all traffic crashes are due to uh, operator decisions, so something that the driver does. So behavioral highway safety is very important to us, and it should be very important to um, all of our stakeholders and partners as we go through and, <clears throat> and try to make our roads safer as we're seeing a, an uptick in fatalities. Um, so, uh, so again, thank you for allowing us to come and, and share with you. Uh, again, as Anne said, my name is Eric Strickland. I'm the uh, Director of Federal Relations for GSA. We're a national nonprofit that represents all state highway safety offices. So every state by law, uh, by federal law, has to have a highway safety office, and we're there just association at the fed at the national level, kind of to be the the one voice as we have discussions with um, with Congress and with different agencies, um, either during the development of uh, legislation such as the FAST Act and its predecessors. I'm going to mention um, Map 21 and moving ahead for progress in the 21st century um, and, and how all that works. And then we're also working with different agencies, uh, particularly at the Department of Transportation and at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration with NHTSA. So uh, we're, their, we're their national voice and, and do our best to represent them. But um, again, every state has its own highway safety office that is, is part of the governor's um, you know, governor's office they have to be appointed by the governor, and so the decisions are, are left up to the state. We we provide the information, but the state kind of goes in its own direction, depending on on the issues that they're going to be addressing there. So, um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to to share and uh, share a little bit of background here that we have on on uh, the FAST. So, what is the FAST Act? As you may know, and and if you've been involved with this for a while, some of this may be old news, but I just want to kind of go over to make sure we're all in at the same spot. It's a five-year bill, so which is excellent, which is a really great thing to have because we get um, funding and we get program authority uh, for five years. Um, the, pre the predecessor to the FAST Act was the uh, MAF 21, and that technically was a two-year bill, and it almost lasted five years uh, just due to extensions and a whole bunch of other uh, entertaining um, things at the congressional level. And so to have something that is solidly a five-year bill gives a lot of needed stability to the states as they develop their plan, know how much they're going to be working um, to you know, either modify laws, change laws, update things, um, and what kind of funding they can expect uh, from year to year. So five years is very important. Um, another important thing is that the FAST Act kept the same structure that MAP-21 uh, created. Uh, when MAP-21 was, was put out there in 2012, I want to, I want to say, um, it redid a lot, of, a lot of how the administrative structure of highway safety grant funding and other pieces was done. And so it, was a, it, took, it took states a while to get their systems up to speed on, on what was going on there. The FAST Act doesn't change anything up, so there's not going to be a huge administrative um, alteration to states as they go to implement the FAST Act, which is great. Um, and then while the FAST Act was signed in December 4th of, uh, of 2014, or 2015, excuse me, uh, all of the provisions will take effect in October 1st, 2016, at the start of fiscal, uh, fiscal year 2017. So that gives um, states time to look at what's going to be coming forward um, and adjust as they need, put their highway safety plans together, 
get everything in. And as um, as uh, Barbara Sowers will talk about here, that gives also time for the federal government to put some of the legislation and some of the rulemaking forward. There was a, a bit of a hiccup with MAP 21. Everything happened so fast after the bill passed that it was very difficult for states to make any changes and try to be uh, meeting the guidelines that are put forward for some of the incentive grants. So a lot of learning was done then, and um, the programs will be starting later this year, which is important to, to note. So the, the funding for the FAST Act. So the funding is going to be there for the full length of, of the FAST Act. As you can see here, um, I put then 2015, what kind of the, the funding levels we're looking at. Section 4.2 is the general broad pillar of highway safety. It's, it's the funding level that states can use to do just about anything they need to, from speed to drunk driving to distracted driving. There aren't a lot of strings attached to it because it's dedicated towards um, program identified highway safety measures. So that's section 4.2. Section 4.5 is where we're going to talk a little bit more about here, uh, and that's the incentive programs. Those are ones that are focused specifically on certain issues and um, states need to meet X number of guidelines to, to make this work. And so you can see there, over the length of the bill, uh, each, each section is going to be increasing. Um, and of note, for the states at least, Section 402 will be increasing at a greater rate than Section 405. Because that Section 402 is, is the pillar of highway safety, um, it's important that uh, more of the funds go there because it allows states to be more nimble in their approaches to to dealing with issues in their states and their communities. Um, the incentive grants are great because they help raise the bar on certain issues, but that Section 402 funds provide the state's ability to really address things that may come up that, that you know, kind of outside the, the realm of the incentive grants, or they may not quite meet the incentive grant guidelines, but they still need to deal with the issue. So Section 402 funds are, are very important. Uh, yeah, you see I have a, an asterisk there, and this is I'll probably have a few more wonky things that I'll share with you, but this is kind of deep in the weeds. But the highway, ooh, the spirit, the uh, highway trust fund is is what funds uh, behavioral highway safety. And should should we have gas receipts that don't meet the expectations that have been put forward within the authorizations, there will be an, an adjustment needed in the funding. So um, should should uh, vehicles start to, you know, travel farther on a tank of gas and people are filling up and so there aren't the the gas receipts going into the federal government for the trust fund. You won't see um you know, you won't see as much going out that way through the trust fund. So that is just something to be um not concerned about, but just something to keep an eye on, because um, it is something that is of concern. Not a because it has been shown as a trend as there's more electric vehicles, there's more hybrid vehicles, uh, fewer receipts are being received from the federal gas tax that then go to the Highway Trust Fund. So that's why we've had some adjustments. Uh, Congress has supplemented what was in the trust fund with general fund transfers, and so everything should be stable through the term of, of the FAST Act, but it is something that I do like to um, keep everyone aware of and just kind of mention on that. So. Uh, General changes on the FAST Act, um, July 1st is the date that states have to put their highway safety plans in. That's just good to know if you're interested in seeing what your state is doing and, and how it's going to be addressing highway safety. They're right now in the process of creating and, and getting their highway safety plans for fiscal year 17 together, talking, you know, talking to grantees to find out who can use these programs. So they're working hard on that because they're due uh, into NHTSA by July 1st for review. Um, and then modifications as needed and, and those kind of things. So um, FAST Act didn't keep that date, but, but NIST is going to keep that date. Uh, it was legislated MAP 21, but it's a, it's a good date to keep, and so that will stay there. Um, the FAST Act also alters the length of time that NIST has to review it, so they have 45 days to review the plans, which is good because um, it gives states more time to make adjustments to NIST to find things that may be lacking or um, you know something else, some data changes come in. So there'll be a more, tame, more time for states to make the alterations they need before the fiscal year begins. Um, the one thing that I would like to mention that is, that is a bit of an impediment to some of the progress that states are making is that there's a thing called um, Highway Safety Infrastructure Program Funding, HSIP funding, which is, which is the infrastructure side. So you have the infrastructure and the behavioral side of highway safety. There used to be the ability for the um, Department of Transportation to use some of those infrastructure funds 
to do some behavioral highway safety programs. Um, not fully, not a lot of them, but just enough to, to put funds into it. So if you have, for example, you're doing a large construction project, you can float some of the infrastructure funds to do behavioral education program for work zone awareness. Um, those monies could go there to help educate, you know, drivers in that area, do signage, you know, maybe also help with paying for extra enforcement in an area to keep the work zone safe for, for everybody, not just the drivers, but also for the, the workers in that area. Um, the ability to do that was removed within the FAST Act, so now no infrastructure funding can go towards any sort of behavioral highway safety, you know, programs. So it's something that states are now going to be trying to work on how to, how to deal with this because um, the funds were not necessarily there beforehand, and so they're going to be working on, you know, where is this, where is this money going to come from that uh, Department of Transportation would normally do. So uh, that's something to just keep in mind. Uh, so as I mentioned, the Section 402 uh, is the, you know, the pillar of highway safety. This is just uh, a few of the things that Section 402 does. It uh, provides uniform guidelines. Um, it does an interesting thing. Um, states cannot use federal funds to create or do anything with automated enforcement, but the FAST Act requires states to use Section 402 funds to do an evaluation and a biennial survey of automated enforcement. So it's kind of one of those things that is not doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and so you know we're going to work through it with with Congress and with NHTSA to, to get it all figured out, make sure we do it correctly. But you can't use the money to create an automated enforcement, so red zone. Uh, red light running campaign or work zone uh, camera stuff, but you know you have to use the money to do a biennial survey. So it's an interesting thing, and so states will be um, uh, addressing that. So there may be something that you'll see uh, come through your office if you're working on something. You may see information on this going out there. Um, it also requires uh, more electronic submissions. So there's going to be an actual program created by NHTSA to do that, so that's important. So it helps kind of move the needle forward and, and making it easier to submit things, remove some of the administrative burden and just uh, uh, kind of paperwork reduction, so that's important. And then also uh, increase the number of kind of teen safety awareness programs, because as we're seeing, you know, we're getting, teen drivers are typically more at risk and, and have some more uh, special issues to address as we're working to, to make them safer. and. Um, and now with more teens waiting until they're older uh, to get a license and maybe even possibly bypassing the graduate driver licensing system in, in a whole, uh, what can we do to get some of these, not just teens, but some novice driver's education? So there's more information there on that. Um, just a note, you know, high visibility enforcement, as you know, through like a, a quicker ticket or a, a drive sober get pulled over campaign where you have the increased law enforcement, whatever your state may allow, whether it's a checkpoint or a wolf pack of law enforcement. Um, this is actually codified now. It, it's always been there. It's always been uh, required by law, but it's actually now a real section. So um, it's good for states. It makes it easier to figure things out. Uh, so now into the meat of the incentive grants for Section 405. Uh, just a quick overview of Section 405. And this is... Uh, a little bit just so you know kind of what the Highway Safety Office is looking at and what they're going to be dealing with. So um, any unallocated Section 4 or 5 grant funds shall be reallocated to Section 2 before the end of the fiscal year. So if you don't qualify for a grant, those monies are not just going to be wasted. They will be reallocated into Section 402 so that, let's say, you don't qualify for a distracted driving grant this year, but your you know, state's working on passing laws so that you do qualify for the incentive grant. Those funds can be transferred to Section 402, and you can use that money then for a distracted driving awareness campaign. Um, just because you couldn't do it through the 405 doesn't mean you can't do it through the 402 um, fund. So it, it's a it's a good thing for states because it again allows that flexibility and allows them to address uh, specific issues that they're facing. Um, uh, it, the the MOE amendment, the uh, maintenance of effort amendment is good because it, again, reduces some of the administrative burden that states are facing. So you may get fewer calls uh, to reach out to different agencies to figure out how much you're spending. So this is an important thing. Um, it allows funds to be used for um, different political subdivisions or Indian tribal governments. That's always been an issue to try to help the tribe address some of the issues that they have on, you know, on their nations. Um, it was difficult to get money to them. 
this allows it easier for a state if they have a good relationship and they know that they're working on something to give some funds to the tribe so that they can address issues that will impact, you know, on tribal land and, and then within the state. So, so that's good. And then we'll talk about it here. The funding percentages are pretty much the same as they were under MAP 21. The only one that was modified is uh, occupant protection to, for the creation of a new um, uh, incentive grant. So speaking of that, occupant protection, so this is the seatbelt awareness. Um, it's very similar to what was there before. So um, just about every state qualifies for this. This is, you know, you need to wear a seatbelt. Um, and for the driver and the passenger, uh, a lot of states go beyond that by making it um, uh, rear seatbelt use as well. It needs to be primary in the front. Um, and the states are now looking more at rear belt use and, and trying to make it primary in the back. So MAP21 uh, laid out some good groundwork in the fact that keeps that the same. The, the biggest change right now is that states that have a high seatbelt use rate can use 100% of the funds for Section 402 activities uh, before that it was, you know, 75%. So this is a good administrative change for your highway safety office that if you're doing a great job and you have over 90% seatbelt use rate, you can um, use the funds for seatbelt and then maybe something else because a lot of times uh, speeding is involved and there's no incentive grant for speeding. So a lot of these things, it's not just seatbelt, but it's other things that are impacting behavior and impacting uh, fatalities in the state. So they can move over and, and, and use the funds for that. Um, this is tra traffic safety improvements. This is working on your data in the state, Section 405C. Um, every state has has the ability to get these funds and um, it meets all the guidelines to my knowledge. Uh, no one's out of out of compliance with this, so I shouldn't see a lot of administrative or, or legal changes that are needed on this. Um, so if states if get those funds to update their records, um, that's important. Um, one that the largest uh, pot of funds for the incentive grants is Section 405D. That's the impaired driving um, incentive grant. The changes that were made in the FAST Act are in general, minimal compared to what was there for MAP 21, but they are significant in just how states are able to allocate and um, address some of the funding uses. So it, it expanded how the funds can be used. Under the MAP 21, impaired driving funds for the Section 405P, a majority were only be able to, were able to be used for um, alcohol impaired driving, which is what the program was originally designed for when it was first set up. Uh, a couple of iterations ago with the transportation bill. As, as you all probably know, and as we're seeing in a lot of our data, more drug use is being, uh, being pre present in fatalities. And so not necessarily, you know, just illegal drugs, but we're seeing states that are starting to do more, um, are starting to legalize uh, marijuana. Uh, we're going to have more issues with that within the driving because the data showing some, some people think that they drive better while under the influence of marijuana. So we're seeing more people just get on the road and not think of it as, as a drug. And they're not looking at, you know, they will never drive drunk, but they will definitely drive high because they don't see those in the same, in the same realm. So um, there were changes that made that allow the funds to be used for drug-related issues. And, and an important part of that is we're seeing more people get behind the wheel under um, uh, prescription drugs, uh, abusing prescription drugs, especially for the youngers, the teens in the early 20s, um, and then all the just uh, the regular thing that you'll see with opioids and, and um, other uh, Schedule One narcotics. And so it's, this will allow states the ability to use some of these um, impaired driving funds for those, for those issues without having to jump through a lot of extra hoops, which I had to do under MAP 21 because they were specifically written for alcohol. This opens it up to full impaired driving. Because um, as we know, you know, alcohol and drugs you still are, are unsafe on the roads, and so this gives the ability to to address those needs. Um, additionally, the impaired driving um, section, uh, for, uh, section four five D, the impaired driving grant, had a subsection, a subgrant that went to states that had um, all offender admission interlocks. So that was a MAP twenty one uh, iteration. It was a I call it kind of the bonus grant for. Um, those states that had all offender ignition interlock programs. Uh, MAP to, or the FAST Act modifies that to still allow states to qualify for those, for those bonus grants if they have the all offender ignition interlock, but it also opens up another portion of uh, additional grant funding for states that have the 24 7 um, uh, sobriety programs. So, for those that may not know, 20, it's, a, it's a program where you monitor offenders um, through either twice day testing 
or depending on the if they're in a very rural location, it's a transdermal device that's, that's on their ankle. Um, some states have um, mobile testing devices where they don't have to come down to an actual police station, but they can do it from the home because it takes a picture of them and sends the data immediately um, and monitors all that. So it's a it's a way to monitor um, offenders, and there it's. Right now, it's been it was piloted and pioneered in South Dakota. A few other states are picking it up. Um, this allows states to uh, to qualify for um, additional funding. Um, again, comparatively, it's only three percent of the additional uh, bonus funds versus it's a there's the bonus funds are fifteen percent of the total four hundred five grant. So if you get the twenty four seven, you get three percent of that. If you have the all offender ignition interlock um, law, you get twelve percent. So there are different um, different qualifying marks, and and the changes were made to the all offender ignition interlock to allow more states to qualify because under Map 21 there were no exceptions allowed. Uh, and just by every state has an exception. If it's you know there's no providers within 100 miles, just kids either if you're medically unable to provide it, or if it's uh, operation of an employer vehicle. So by providing these exceptions, um, there will be a few more states that qualify, which is important and. It allows more states to look at getting an all offender admission airlock uh, law in place because it has those exceptions and, and helps them to address it. So, uh, so good changes that were made there. Um, the next section, which is important again, a lot of discussion as well, is the distracted driving 405E. Uh, no one, well, I take that back. Connecticut qualified for distracted driving grant funds out of the Map 21 structure of the of the law. It was very restrictive under Map 21 and. Um, not to say that it did have good pieces in it, but it just did not allow states to to even try to meet it without wholesale, you know, wholesale revamping of their programs. And so, uh, Fast Act recognizes that, and members of Congress understood that this is not the goal. The incentive grants are meant to be a ladder to success. So, you know, it should be states should have pieces in place, and it should be easier for them to modify a certain law, not just change a whole lot, but maybe just modify it a little bit. So distracted, dra distracted driving grant was modified in a way to allow more states to qualify. Um, so that's that's good. And you'll probably see more highway safety offices looking um, or having conversations about this section uh, and what need, what is needed to qualify uh, because the changes were dramatic enough where some states may qualify automatically. They don't have to make any law changes. The biggest restriction was uh, to qualify for the incentive grant. You had to have uh, in code in your statute, you had to have the questions on distracted driving that were going to be asked for a driver's ed exam. I think I think Connecticut was the only state that actually had that in statute. So by removing that requirement um, and just making sure that it, you know distracted driving is part of a driver's ed exam, uh, I think that helps a lot of states to qualify. And the other changes that were made are are not as dramatic. And so if a state doesn't you know, meet the full qualifications. They just need to make a couple small changes, which would be a lot easier than making a whole new law. So, um, so that's important, and I think you'll see a lot of states working to address that. Um, this this slide just kind of talks about what the funds can be used for. Um, so, again, I I try not to be wonky, but it's kind of hard for me not to be wonky. So, I just kind of put this in there. And as you look at the slides later, if you have questions on that, let me know. I will point out that it does um, it does share that there is a a two-year grant program written into distracted driving. So as states work to address and tweak their laws to be able to qualify for the full distracted driving incentive grant, there is a smaller grant, 25% uh, of the total pop, uh, total funds that would be available on, uh, for the incentive grant in fiscal 17 and in fiscal 18 uh, that have smaller requirements. Um, so if a state has just like a basic text message that's either primary or secondary, um, they'll qualify. So that's just about every state. So you'll get, you know, most states will qualify at fiscal 17, which gives them some funds to use for distracted driving, uh, you know, issues and allows them time to change it. So something to keep in mind there. Um, section 405 is the motorcycle safety. Uh, there were no real big changes made in that section. Um, the biggest part was just uh, and how the funds can be used uh, by the states and the, the qualifying requirements. Um, if you if you have a low amount of fatalities, you could qualify now before there was other specific requirements that needed to be met. So this just kind of helps a few more states qualify for the for the incentive funds for that. It also requires 
um, Department of U.S. Department of Transportation to create a share the road model language for um, driver instruction on how to share the road with motorcyclists. That's something that um, uh, is already out there, but it just requires them to be modified. Uh, Section 4 or 5G is the graduated driver's licensing program. So this is for driver's education for young drivers, teen drivers. Um, no state qualified for GDL under MAP, the years of MAP 21. So this is another one where Congress, you know, GHSA and others, and it's, uh, many states said, hey, you know, if you're going to put this program out there, you should make it so that states can actually qualify for it. So there were quite a few adjustments made. The biggest one is um, the pro GDL programs required for anyone 18 and younger. MAP 21 had 21 and younger, so no one really has a, a GDL for anyone 21 and under. So uh, this opened up the door for many more states are ready to qualify if they have 18 and under. Um, it, you know, made things a little bit less prescriptive within the large permit phase and the intermediate permit phase, so that's important. Um, and then uh, it allows for 100% of the funds to be used for for two projects. Uh, if they have the lowest, uh, you know, low percentage of guys. So similar to the uh, motorcycle safety one, if you're doing a really good job on on teen driving and you have low fatalities, you'd be able to use the funds for four or two type of things. So less strings that would be attached to the incentive grant, you can use it for more of a holistic uh, behavioral highway safety approach. So you still address the GDL stuff, but you can also, you know, use it to address teen speeding or whatever you may want to do. Um, so it opens up the door for a few other things. This is the new incentive grant, the non-motorized safety. So um, you can think of it as this as the pedestrian and the um, uh, pedestrian bike safety kind of incentive grant. Uh, it's a it's a unique grant in that you only qualify if you have a certain number of fatalities that are pedestrian and bike related in your um, in your state and your community. So. Uh, NHTSA just published that list, and I want to say there's 23 states that qualify for it right now. Um, and so you would use these funds within the non-motorized safety incentive grant to address that's just what it sounds like. You would use it to try to uh, decrease the number of fatalities from pedestrian bike fatalities um, and injuries and things like that. So just because a state doesn't qualify doesn't mean that they're not going to be looking and addressing uh, pedestrian bike safety. Just about every state does, uh, again, by using those 402 funds. So uh, the 23 states that qualify, they will they will apply for this grant, and if they meet all of the qualifications that are put out there, they will uh, they will get these funds, and they can use it for training for law enforcement officers, um, and then just doing different mobilizations and campaigns with law enforcement officials and uh, doing public education. So it's a it's a campaign, or it's a it's an incentive grant that is more of a educational campaign and training campaign for law enforcement, but it's important. Uh, to get out there, and it's an important grant to have, and so this is a new one that states are going to be including, um, and uh, it's kind of one of those ones where it's good you don't qualify because it means your fatalities are low, but it um, doesn't mean that nothing's going to be done because they're still going to be addressing it through um, different ways, just not directly through this incentive grant fund, so, um, so that's good to know. Uh, as I mentioned about drug driving, so that's all the incentive grants um, that are out there, and, and the one that would require a lot of law changes. Uh, Drunk driving is just, I just want to put it out there, something that states are going to be looking at a lot. And so you may see more legislation on this, on, on addressing, you know, some states may put something out there, what is what is driving under the influence of drugs? You know, is there going to need to be kind of a alcohol type of VAC level? So is there going to be a, a drunk level, or a, I'm sorry, a drug level that needs to be out there, or a certain anagram level? Um, so that's, you may see more on that. So. The FAST Act requires DOT to do some studies on marijuana and herd driving, um, and then to work with uh, you know, different stakeholders from the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Health and Human Services, and State Highway Safety Offices to find ways to increase the public awareness about the dangers of drug and herd driving. As I said, uh, some you know some states that have legalized uh, marijuana use right now, some of their early data that they found is people think they're safer. They drive better when they're high because they're slower, they, they pay attention to things more. Not necessarily true. And so um, we're going to try to, we need to try to educate the public and, and address that and look to see what we have going on out there. Um, and you'll be able to kind of see what states have applied for what because NIT is going to be required at the, uh, to take all of the applications and put all the data, I mean, they put all the applications right now online and available for anyone to look at, but they're going to have to put in one spot what state applies for what uh, for the incentive grant, 
uh, what states received what from the incentive grant, and if they did not receive an incentive grant, what were the reasons why for not receiving it? So you'll be able to see you did not receive the graduate driver's license incentive grant because you don't have a nighttime restriction that meets the guidelines that have been put forward, or you don't have a um, restriction on the number of individuals that can be in the vehicle with the driver. So this will be good because states will then have an opportunity to look at to see why they didn't qualify for the incentive grant and the reasons that NHTSA has said that they don't qualify for the incentive grant. So it's a, it's a way to, as you're looking to make your legislative changes, it'll help out with fiscal 18, um, you know, to get a handle on what's going on out there. So. Um, uh, no, mon no funds can be used for motorcycle checkpoints. This is uh, just information for you all. And then um, uh, since I'm running out of time, just to highlight this. There's always research that's being done, and so states uh, continue to get uh, research projects on different issues affecting behavioral highway safety. So uh, that stayed within, um, you know, within the FAST Act, and so that's great. So if there's any issue that you ever kind of want to address, talk to Highway Safety Office, and they can look to see if there's going to be some research that's going to be done on that. And with that, uh, I thank you for your time, and we'll be able to answer questions uh, at the end. And thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, for that great summary. I actually learned a lot, so thank you. As, as a quick reminder to our audience, again, you can use the chat feature on your screen to ask a question, and we will get to those following all of the presentations. Uh, right now, I would like to introduce our final speaker, Barbara Bowers from NISA, to share information on highway safety data and to give us more details on the grant requirements and deadlines. So Barbara, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. It really is a pleasure to participate today. Uh, we really appreciate our partnership with NCSL and the Governor's Highway Safety Association and the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, NHTSA's mission is to reduce crashes, deaths, injuries, and costs associated with those things on the nation's highways. My office, along with the 10 regional offices, work with highway safety offices in the state, territory, Puerto Rico, the District of Columbia, and the Department of Interior to conduct life-saving highway safety programs. Next, please. I have a short presentation for you today, but I have to start off by telling you what I can't talk about which is a lot of detail because we have a pending implementing regulation. When we have an open rulemaking, we are prohibited from engaging in dialogue um, and talking too much about it. And that's why there is a docket for people to pose their questions and comments. But there are some things I can talk about today. I'll provide you with a few highlights about our NHTSA grant program with some emphasis on the law-based grant. I'll also talk a bit about the highway safety problem experienced across the nation and how these programs are able to uh, address those programs, those problems. Next, please. As Eric told you, the FAST Act is all about safety in the state. It's the first long-term authorization in over 10 years. The authorization increases funding to the state. It adds new grant programs, eases some qualification requirements, and allows states more flexibility in spending their grant funds. Next. On May 23rd, NHTSA published its interim final role as required in order to provide guidance to the states on how to apply for and spend NHTSA grant funds. The comment period for this rule runs through the end of October. For those of you who are familiar with the MAP 21 regulation, you may notice some reorganization and streamlining of grant requ requirements. And notice that some requirements, as Eric told you, um, do require states to provide us with a legal citation to determine whether or not a state qualifies for a grant under that particular program. The most important date for you to remember relative to the grant program is that July 1st date. States are required to submit their highway safety plans and 
grant application to NHTSA no later than July 1st of each year. And since a legal citation is part of that application, that's an important date for states to keep in mind when they're considering passing or modifying state laws. Next. So why do we even have a highway safety grant program? Well, I don't need to tell you that we can't improve highway safety across the nation from here in Washington, D.C. States are in the best position to address their unique problems. Giving funding to the states helps them do just that. What you may not know is that we are seeing a steep rise in fatalities despite years of steady decline. And we're showing what we're forecasting with our 2015 data, 9.3% rise. We are hoping that the states will take advantage of these great grant programs and the funds to reverse trends. Next. And I'd like to take a moment and get a little bit more specific about the data. In 2014, 32,675 people died in motor vehicle crashes, over 2 million injured, and there were over 6 million police reported crashes. And we know that human factors contribute to the vast majority of these crashes. Once again, this is what our grant program can address, the human factor side of things. If you look at the box on the right, you'll see some astounding facts. Every six seconds, a crash is reported to law enforcement. Saddest of all, every 16 minutes, someone dies in a traffic crash. We're meeting together today for an hour. We're going to lose probably four, three to four people during just the time of this meeting. Next, please. So now I'll give you a high-level overview of our grant programs of which there are three, state and community grant program, the section 405 incentive program, and the resurrected section 1906 racial profiling data collection grant. Next. I like to think of the section 402 program as the bread and butter of highway safety grants. It allows states the broadest flexibility to address their problems as identified through data collection and analysis. This is a formula grant program that is based primarily, at least for the state, on population and roadway miles. There is a minimum allocation for those states that, have, that are smaller, and there's different requirements on how we provide funds to territories. Again, I want to emphasize that by July 1st of each year, States are going to submit a highway safety plan describing their problems and program plans and how they'll use this funding to conduct these programs. If you're interested, NHTSA does post the plans and the annual reports on our website. In the program and grant section, you'll be able to take a look at the highway safety plans and annual reports for the last several fiscal years. Next, please. The National Priority Safety Program is an incentive grant program. This means that if states provide us with certain pieces of information and or possess a law that meets the statutory and regulatory requirements, they're eligible to receive NHTSA grant funds. And Eric did a great job describing those statutory requirements. This slide shows you the authorized funding amounts as well as the grant programs under the FAST Act. And Eric described all these to you. Next, please. As you've heard a few times from both Eric and me, some of these grant programs are law-based. This means that the states have to pass and enact by a certain date legislation that conforms with the federal requirements. So for example, under our Occupant Protection Program, if states were to apply for a grant under this, they're eligible to apply under six different criteria, but they have to meet only three. Two of the criteria are law-based. 
and Eric talked about those. The state has a primary belt law and or they have a law that requires occupant restraints for passengers in all seating positions. They very well need, may meet one or two of the criteria. The other grants that you see here, interlock, 24-7, distracted driving, Eric did a great job describing them. These are law-based programs. So please read carefully the statute and the IFR to see exactly what those requirements are. Continuing on the next slide, you'll see the last three programs, DL and motorcyclist safety. Motorcyclist safety is another grant program that has multiple criteria under which a state can apply and they only have to meet two of them. One of the criteria is law-based involving fees collected from the motorcyclist training program. It simply says that that money must be allowed back to the program. And then Congress resurrected a program that was under an older authorization, the safety lieu legislation, called racial profiling data collection. They made some changes to reduce some of the requirements, and they did include a law-based requirement um, for the states to abide by. That's described here for you. Next, please. Although we like to incentivize, we do implement in cooperation with the Federal Highway Administration two penalty transfer programs. Impaired driving is a huge problem in this country, accounting for 31% of the fatalities. These programs are designed to promote enactment of strong open container and repeat intoxicated driver laws because we know these save lives. These are alcohol programs only. They're not drugs, alcohol and drugs. They are alcohol impaired driving only. And what happens is if states do not have these laws in place, one or both of the laws, a certain percentage of their funds from the Federal Highway Administration um, get reserved for other uses, some of which can be impaired driving prevention on the NHTSA side. Next, please. We really appreciate what NCSL and GHSA are doing to promote highway safety in the state. And if you're not already doing so, I want to encourage the two memberships to work closely. There is a state office of highway safety in every state, as Eric described, and that would be a good place to start as you consider changing or enacting a law in order to meet NHTSA grant requirements. Thank you very much for today. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you, Eric, for taking the time to be here today. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. And so um, I will read them. And then uh, the two panelists can hopefully answer a few of them. The first one is, um, when you say a mandatory fine for distracted driving grant qualification, does that include statutes with a mandatory fine but then allows for a discharge of that fine upon the proof the offender subsequently purchased a hands-free device? Uh, this is Eric, and that is a very good question um, that I do not have an answer for you on. Uh, just it sounds like um, it may not because from what some of the stuff I've read and from what I understand is that you can't, you know, you can't essentially void the fine and um, it has to stay on there and be part of their, their driving record. But that is something that um, hopefully your highway safety office will know because they've gone through the application. So I'd recommend reaching out to them on that to uh, get a more definitive answer. Definitive answer. And if uh, they are unable to, unable to provide it, just send me a note and I will dig into it when I, um, uh, when I can get to it uh, next week. Great. Um, I also have uh, another question here. Yeah, um, is there a competitive aspect to the 405 grant funds or are states guaranteed to get the funds as long as they meet the minimum requirements? Uh, I'll go ahead and take this, Barb, you can add in if you'd like. 
it's, it's not necessarily competitive. Um, the percentage of funds that go to the states, if there's more, if there are fewer states that qualify, there would be more money that go to those states that qualify. There's a cap as to how much each state, each state can receive, um, but it's not necessarily competitive. So if every state qualifies, they all get the funds. If, you know, 40 states qualify, uh, they'll get just a little bit more than they would have if, if 50 states and all the territories are qualified. So, um, but there's a cap. So like with the distracted driving grant through MAP 21, Connecticut was the only state that qualified, but they didn't get all of the funds that were set aside for distracted driving incentive grant. They got, um, they got their allotment plus a little bit extra due to the, uh, the cap limit that was in place. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the, the next question is a really interesting one um, because it has to do with the new bicycle and pedestrian incentive grant. Does the 405H grants include electric bikes, segways, and powered skateboards? Um, I am thinking through that right now. Other than knowing that I would not be able to actually operate one of those hoverboard things, <laughs> um, I, I can't say for sure if if the 405H uh, includes those specifically. Um, I would have to look at the definitions of, of what a bike is, and normally a definition of a bike is actually uh, you know something that is pedal powered. Um, but unless you know a little bit more detail right now, Barb, that's another one that I just have to dig a little more into the definitions on. Right, it is pedestrian and bicycle. I see. Okay, so um, with the electric bikes and segways and powered skateboards, which are, you know, coming out and, and becoming more popular, um, so I think it's a good question, but it, it sounds like it's just strictly for pedestrian and bicyclists. And, yeah, and this is Eric again. And, again, not for, uh, not to be used as a definitive answer for anything. I would think that the electric bikes might have a little more flexibility because normally those are hybrids where it's pedal powered and the energy that you put into the pedal goes to charge the battery and all of that. So um, that may be considered a bicycle. bicycle. The segways and the, the powered skateboards and the, the hotter boards and things, um, it, honestly, I think it depends on what the definition of pedestrian is within the IFR um, and what the definition of pedestrian is within your state. And, and with that being said, I would also recommend that states uh, look over the IFR that NHTSA has put out there because it is an interim final rule and NHTSA is taking comments until October. And so something like this is worth bringing up uh, and maybe submitting a comment to see that NHTSA takes it, maybe looks at the definition of what pedestrian is. So when they put the final regulation out, they'll have addressed this uh, a little bit more clearly um, as we're seeing an uptick with a number of people getting those uh, for the hoverboards for lack of a better uh, definitional term. So. Um, so that is, you know, again, that's not the final answer, I think, on that, but I think it's a, it's a direction that might help out. Great. Thank you. Um, and our final question actually comes from my colleague, Amanda Essex, who works on uh, GDL laws and everything, but she has a question on the occupant protection. Um, in order for a state to apply for the occupant protection grants, does the primary enforcement have to be for all seating positions? or can it just be for the front seating position? Um, as of right now, I believe it's just for the front seating positions. Um, there are very few states that have primary for, for rear positions, but I believe that is one of the qualifying, as, as Barbara put out there, that you know meet one of the X criteria. Uh, so I think if you don't have it for primary for all, there might be other criteria that states are meeting. But um, again, and I'm sorry to say, I don't have that right in front of me. Um, so it's a definitional and a criteria thing. And if that's Barb, can maybe uh, supplement that? I don't, I don't think you have to have primary for all the positions. Right. Great. So, yeah, I was just going to say the requirement is that the state hasn't acted and is enforcing OP statutes that make a violation. Um, of the requirement to be secured in a belt or child restraint a primary offense. Um, so if, if there's a further question on that, um, we can get any, a better answer to you if you like. 
Okay, great, thank you. I know that uh, NCSL has a map online in its um, seatbelt webpage about which states have primary and secondary for the front and rear seating provision. So if, uh, if you would like to reference that, um, you certainly may. So I think we will wrap up, and I wanted to thank all of our distinguished panelists again for discussing the FAST Act with us. Eric and Barbara, we really thank you and very much appreciate you taking the time and presenting today. And I'd also like to thank everybody out there for joining us today. Again, an archive of today's webinar will be available soon on NCSL's website if you want to review any portion of it or if any of your colleagues were unable to join us today. Finally, we at NCSL invite you to call us with any questions you had on today's webinar or other traffic safety issues. And again, we will continue to track and provide updates on these issues um, and are available to assist you. Just please contact our office. So please have a great rest of the day and a wonderful holiday weekend, and we appreciate you tuning in today. Thank you.